four, three, two, and one. Welcome to the Brisbane City Council meeting of March 16th, 2023. City Clerk, roll call, please. Um, Madam Mayor, you, you want to call the meeting to order? Oh, do the call pledge the meeting to order at 7.30 p.m. And 7.31. And do the Pledge of Allegiance. Oh my gosh, I'm missing it. Pledge of Allegiance, we'll start with. I pledge, pledge allegiance to, to the flag of the United, United, United States, States of America and, and to, to the republic, republic for which it stands, stands one, one nation, nation, under God, God indivisible, with liberty and justice, justice for, all. for all. Okay, now, roll call, please. So, Madam Mayor, there are no requests to attend the meetings remotely. Um, so we'll start with Council Member Lentz. I'm here. <laughs> Council Member Mackin. Here. Council Member O'Connell. Here. Mayor Davis. Here. Council Member Cunningham is absent. Okay, so now we will move to adoption of the agenda. Do I have a, a motion? So moved. Second. Okay, city clerk, roll call, please. Council member Lentz. Yes. Council member Mackin. Aye. Council member O'Connell. Aye. And Mayor Davis. Aye. We will now move to awards and presentations. Item B, San Mateo County Health Presentation on Preventing Fentanyl Overdoses. Hold on, okay. we got to turn your mic up a little bit. Good evening, Mayor Davis and members of the council. Thank you for inviting us to come to present to you about fent the fentanyl crisis in San Mateo County. Uh, I am here this evening with two of my colleagues, Todd Henderson and Mark Ross. We're gonna take turns talking with you this evening and we'll start off with Todd. Good evening, I'm Todd Henderson. I'm an IMAT case manager for San Mateo County. And presentation tonight will be on the fentanyl crisis. So this is what we're gonna be talking about. We're gonna be talking about Oh, that way. Excuse me, sorry. There we go. Okay, there we go. So we are gonna be discussing uh, the basics about drugs, including fentanyl, the reason people use drugs, and the signs and symptoms of drug use, and then what you can do as a community to keep us safe as a community, prevention strategies and treatment options. So why do people use drugs? Basically, because it changes the way we feel. Someone might use drugs for to relieve stress or anxiety. They might have chronic pain. They might have some boredom and just want to use drugs. They might have a health condition uh, that makes them use drugs. They might be depressed or sad. Then a problem amongst teens would be peer pressure. Um, celebrities you see in the newspaper, friends using, Everyone's doing it. And then, you know, somebody might have a trauma. They might have been afflicted by a rape or, you know, some traumatic event in their life. And basically because they work. So why are opioids prescribed? Primarily used for acute pain relief, including surgical care the less common long-term unmanageable chronic pain, which is not recommended, uh, suppression of diarrhea, opioid use disorder treatment, and suppressing cough. And now I'm gonna turn it over to Edith. 
So the research is showing that there are uh, specific drugs that are used most often in the community and our, our specific interest in San Mateo County is among youth who should not have access to drugs. Alcohol is the number one um, substance used by youth. Second is cannabis. Third is tobacco, including and especially vaping. Over-the-counter medicines like cough syrup is also used by young people. And we might not know it, but some cough syrup um, formulations can be up to 25% alcohol. And we really recommend that parents take a look at the medicine that they're about to give their children. And MDMA or ecstasy is the fifth, is the fifth substance that's used most often by young people. Some of the signs of drug use you see here listed. Any one of these could happen to any one of us on any given day if we had a rough night or didn't get enough sleep or anything like that. What we want parents and people in the community to look for is when these types of symptoms last over a long period of time, and especially if there are multiple of these symptoms that you see in your child over a long period of time. These um, symptoms can represent different the use of different drugs, but if you see them, it doesn't matter what the drug is, you should think about getting your child some help. So take a look at those, what those signs and symptoms are. Sometimes they look okay, sometimes they're not. Rather than think, oh, everything should be okay, start to ask questions. Some of the effects of substance use you see here, we uh, are giving you the, the effects, the short-term effects and the long-term effects of alcohol, cannabis, and opioids specifically, because opioids are our most current um, crisis that we're having, but alcohol and cannabis being the most used in the community, we felt that you need to know what the short-term and the long-term impacts are, because short-term things might be okay, especially if you stop, but long-term, if you, especially if you develop a, a dependence or an addiction, it can become a real problem. Hi, my name is Mark, uh, Mark Ross. I'm an IMAT case manager. Um, I work in an emergency department and we link folks to medication assisted treatment for addiction. Um, so opioids, uh, opioids, there's a list above. Um, some of the most common ones you see are the, the hydrocodone, oxycodone or codeine. Um, you might get those at a dental visit. Uh, Fentanyl is one of the newer ones, and that's uh, obviously the area of concern lately because it's so much more potent. And um, a lot of times you're finding fentanyl infiltrating other substances or people don't even realize that they're taking an opioid drug, um, but they've got fentanyl in their system. Uh, the, but the goals of these medications are innocent enough. It's just to usually used to reduce pain, but a lot of people find that they feel good and they produce a euphoria. Um, with the opioid use um, comes tolerance and that's where problems start to start to occur because you can take more and more to get the same effect. Um, and then when you stop, you become ill, um, which, which results in behavior changes and all sorts of drug seeking behaviors that can be problematic. And we'll move on to the next one. So how do opioids work? So we have opioid receptors uh, in our brain, um, and those uh, usually would respond to, um, you know, if you have some sort of uh, traumatic event where you're feeling pain, um, there's, uh, you know, uh, chemicals in your brain that, calm you down a little bit, take the edge off. Well, the opiates do a little bit more than that. Uh, they're, they're strong and they're fast and they're effective. So they alter the way people uh, perceive pain. And uh, while they're not painkillers, like a lot of people would say, they do relieve uh, pain and they're good at that. And so they also result in feelings of uh, relaxation, elation, um, or you may even see people uh, just completely sedated uh, to where they're speaking really slowly, um, just, just nodding out. So some of the short-term effects, uh, mood swings, slowed breathing is one to really look for. Um, 
clouded mental function, people are spaced out. Uh, you can have nausea as a result of taking the medication, or you can have nausea as a result of stopping taking the medication. Um, people that do become addicted, uh, that's something you really look for is like vomiting, nausea. Uh, sedation and drowsiness, probably the most two common things you would see with opioid use. Um, and it does lower your body temperature. And if you do too much, you, you've got risk of the, the bottom two consequences, the chance of, of going into a coma, stopping breathing. So fentanyl is uh, the most worrisome uh, right now because it's such, uh, as you can see, the, the penny and just the little tiny amount that it takes uh, for a person to overdose. Um, now, some people do huge amounts of fentanyl, and, and the tricky part is you don't know the concentration, mm -hmm. especially if it's mixed into another substance or if it's a street drug that's not, you know, doled out by a pharmacy. It could be super strong or it could be mild and easily tolerated. So, um, again, it's great for pain, uh, you know, people with severe pain from cancer, things like that. Uh, fentanyl is a godsend but you know, used inappropriately, it can be extremely dangerous and deadly. Um, the most common forms you'll see around here uh, are, are um, powders, um, but it does come in injectable form. Um, tasteless, odorless, colorless, just looks like a harmless little white powder. But uh, what, what we've seen is that you know, even $10 worth could be a fatal dose. And so, you know, um, ten dollars is pretty easy to come up with, uh, and that's I think that's probably what just makes it so scary. So we feel that there are prevention measures that we can uh, put into place to prevent um, drug-related deaths, especially and including fentanyl deaths. And a lot of that is in primary prevention. A lot of these things that you will see are shouldn't be rocket science. These are things that we recommend uh, as children develop and as parents become parents that we we recommend that they do in their household. Um, what can youth do? They can develop strong relationship with their parents. They can create a friend group that they really trust. You really need to know who the people are that you're spending time with. Research shows that how well you do is very dependent on who you hang out with when you're an adolescent. You should learn clear and firm refusal skills so that if somebody uh, pressures you into using a substance that you don't feel like taking, you know how to say no and um, that you can leave the situation if you feel unsafe in it. You want to be able to share your feelings with other people. Mental health is one of the challenges that our young people are, are going through right now. And part of it is they don't have anybody that they can talk with. They need to find people they trust that they can share their feelings with. We recommend that they find, find an adult that's not a parent, that they can trust, will support them, and um, be able to ask for help if, if it came to that. We also really recommend, because adolescent years are the years when young people are experimenting, it is part of adolescence to poke at their, at their boundaries and, and try different things. We recommend that if you're going to try a substance, never, never do it alone, because being alone means you don't have help if you get into trouble. And we also need to educate yourself via trusted sources. We teach young people media literacy and be able to know what messages are being sent to you that might be targeting you and might be unhealthy for you. So know where you can find accurate information. For parents, um, we, we recommend that parents really work at accepting and supporting their children for who they are and not who they want the children to be. And we we see, hear about parents putting a whole lot of pressure on their children and thinking you should be like so-and-so rather than just accepting their children as they are. You should communicate your expectations and your boundaries clearly and hold your children accountable. We're doing research right now with uh, uh, communities in San Mateo County, and it's one of the things that young people are saying, I was able to say no to drugs because I had boundaries. My parents were very clear with me about what they expected me to do. Parents don't always realize how much of an influence they are on their children. Really important to know that you are their number one teacher and their number one, probably, cheerleader and ally. You should know who your um, children's friends are. 
you should know who their friend, who the, your, their friend's parents are. Sometimes it's not the friend. Sometimes it's the environment that the friends are in. So the more you know about your child and their life, the better off you're going to be as, as a parent. As they get older and they start to make decisions, maybe without you. Um, really good to know where they are and with whom. It gets harder and harder as they get older. This is why we recommend that as, uh, while they're still young, that you build those strong relationships with them. And you need to keep talking and listening to your children. Sometimes they don't look like they're listening. Sometimes they look like they're not interested in, in hearing what you have to say, but they are listening because they do repeat what you say and they do live by um, the things, whether for or against the things that you say, they do listen to you. Assure them that their feelings are natural. Some of the things that children say is that they don't feel that their parents accept them because when they say something, the parents will dismiss it. So we really recommend that parents really think when you're an adolescent, there are things that happen that didn't happen before you're an adolescent. And these things are normal. Maybe read up on, on healthy adolescents and let your child know that what they're going through, everybody goes through and they're okay. Also be there for your children. Sometimes they do things, sometimes they make mistakes. Really important that parents continue to be there for their children as they go through life. And while they are under our roof, let's give them as much of the support as, they, as we can possibly give them. Also know the signs and symptoms of possible mental health challenges and drug use um, and seek help if, if needed. What can schools do? Lots of things that schools can do. Our children spend a whole lot of time in schools. Schools need to create a safe environment for learning. Um, in addition to uh, putting together an academic, uh, academically rigorous program, also consider that the physical, social, and emotional needs of children also need to be met during the school hours. If possible, facilitate having provision of services on campus. Some of the reasons why young people are not able to go to treatment is because they can't get to treatment. The more we have treatment more readily available where they are during their day, the better off we're gonna be. If they have to take three buses to get to a treatment program, we might not be successful in getting them into treatment. Um, we would like for schools to review their discipline policies and practices and take a look at how those practices might be affecting children from different groups differently. We are looking at the, at the data from the schools and we see that there are specific children who are getting more into trouble than other groups of children. And ensure that your school has naloxone, Narcan is a common name for that, um, and is prepared to address the overdose. Um, naloxone is available for free from the state of California and um, there's online trainings on how to use them and the health department is happy to come or have partners come to train you if um, needed. Those are links for where um, you can get information on how to get naloxone. What can people do at home? Uh, if you have to go to the doctor and need uh, pain treatments while um, opioids are an option for pain treatment, ask if there are non-opioid uh, options first. Uh, exception for this is when you're in the hospital and a doctor is taking care of you and you're in acute pain, those medicines um, are okay because they're getting uh, dispensed from a, from a pharmacy. Uh, we recommend that you don't keep extra pills at home. Once your prescription is done, turn them in. There are drug take pack pro programs that are uh, part of police departments and other locations in the community. Also, please don't flush um, th those medicines, extra medicines, um, or put them in the garbage. Also increase your awareness about uh, drugs and their impact. Um, prescription drugs can be dangerous. Opioids can, can lead to um, addiction and dependency. Uh, we need to put more resources into prevention and treatment programs, and we need to reduce the stigma uh, for people to talk about um, drug use and mental, uh, mental health uh, challenges. Um, somebody who is uh, under the influence of drugs should not be stigmatized and we should not be forgetting that they are still human. They're somebody's brother and sister, mother and father, and um, they are members of our family and our community. Uh, and we need to talk about these issues. Now that our, more and more of our children are suffering from um, mental health challenges, we really need to be looking at this as a community. And probably most important, don't buy drugs off the street or online. If you have a friend who's handing you a pill and tells you it's okay, unless you know where that pill came from, you have to assume that pill has fentanyl and that pill can kill you. One pill can kill. 
it won't move forward. All right, and with help. Thank you. Okay. Yeah, that last little piece, you know, I, a lot of people don't realize, I, I mean, I work in an emergency situation and people come in for a benzodiazepine addiction. Uh, so like Valium, um, uh, Ativan, drugs like that. And it turns out that they test negative for benzodiazepines. So what they were addicted to is fentanyl and they've been taking fake benzodiazepines for a long period of time. Any little pill, you just really, if you don't know where it came from, get rid of it and, and get rid of your old prescriptions because kids are, kids are rascally about getting into that. And they know, they know what pills are. Um, so harm reduction, that's uh, the field that I work in. You know, there, there are a lot of examples, uh, sunscreen, seat belts, speed limits. They don't fix everything, but they reduce the harm associated with it. You could still die in a car crash, but most likely you're not going to because you're wearing your seat belt. Um, and uh, with drugs, when you stop using drugs, um, or some people reduce using drugs, and, and we, we try to, um, to not stigmatize them. We try to affirm them making changes in their lives for the positive, even if it's not perfect. We want to encourage them to, to make the effort. Um, so uh, people, instead of calling people drug addicts, we'll, we'll call them a person experiencing substance use disorder. Um, with uh, a, a mental illness, instead of saying this person is a schizophrenic, we'll say this is a person with schizophrenia. We really try to, to minimize the, every, people are scared to ask for help. And so if we judge them as soon as they come in, uh, they're, they're never going to ask for help. And I think that's important with parents as well. Um, another important one, you know, uh, uh, sometimes uh, parents will drug test their, their children. And, you know, if uh, the test comes back positive, oh, you're dirty. Uh, we like to say, you know, the test is positive. You know, uh, let's talk about next steps because obviously you've been using. Um, so, so really we do a lot to try to, you don't, you only get a few chances to do interventions and you don't want to scare the person away. You really want, you really want to have them be willing to talk to you and to ask for help. And so uh, that's part of the reason we, we practice harm reduction with the clients. And uh, so, yeah, here's a, here's a, a pop quiz. Which one of those, uh, which one of those pills are, or which are real and which are fake? Maybe just between the, the few, they all, they all look pretty real. Only one of those pills is real. And that one is the Adderall, which I believe is in the, uh, okay, yeah, with the little arrow. So, so yeah, generally it, it's really easy to press pills with a pill press. Fentanyl comes in a powder form. And so uh, even a street level dealer might have a pill press where they make pills. So um, if, you find, uh, if you find pills around the house, Time to have the talk. Uh, so signs of an overdose. Um, uh, first, you know, you want to check if the person's responsive. Make sure uh, that they're breathing. Um, let's see. Yeah, go ahead and uh, thanks. So a lot of times what you're going to see in an opioid overdose is, is somebody that's not rousable. They're leaning over. They're nodding over. They might have snoring sounds, uh, snoring respiration, or they might not be breathing at all, and they might start turning blue. And this can happen pretty fast. So the first thing to do when you notice this is to call 911. Um, you don't want to leave them alone. You want to call 911 while you're with them, and then you want to attempt uh, some of the next, uh, next efforts to... Um, to help them. Okay, so where do we get help? Uh, you can talk to your primary health healthcare provider, or if for Medi-Cal clients, you can connect with our access call center line, um, which is listed there, 1-800-686-0101. And then the other choice is you can always call us 
um, at the e ER uh, IMAT support line, which is 650-573-2735. Uh, that phone is pretty much staffed from uh, every day of the week, um, from seven in the morning till uh, roughly nine o'clock at night with the exception of weekends. And we really try to help, you know, in a non-judgmental, caring, compassionate way. And, and I think that's important to know. Thank you. Thank you. That's our presentation. Do you have questions? We had a member of the public um, approach us about distributing Narcan. Mm -hmm. Do you have, um, and, and I don't know that we're the appropriate entity to do that, but do you have recommendations of maybe local nonprofits they might be able to partner with in that effort? Um, maybe besides obviously yourself, but are there any other like harm reduction nonprofits in San Mateo County that you would suggest? We do have treatment programs in different locations in San Mateo County, and they will have Narcan available. We are recommending that uh, school districts have a policy that they want to see Narcan in every, um, at least middle school and high school. Um, and so that's something to look into because we have a, a school in every community, probably within short distance of where we live. So we recommend that. And I am um, not sure whether or not that's the case in Brisbane. Do you think that also like places like clubs, maybe like we don't have any clubs in Brisbane, but maybe in San Francisco, like nightlife clubs or bars might be like a viable place to approach if they want, you know, they might, it might be good for them to have Narcan on hand too. We actually are recommending that anybody who thinks they might come across somebody who might be, um, who could benefit from Narcan, have Narcan and they and Narcan will be made available to them. We're recommending other groups like even scout troops who are going all over the wilderness who might come across people, that, that that's also an appropriate organization. Did you have another? Sure. Something to add? Yeah, I mean, I, I, uh, I keep Narcan in my car, in my glove box. Uh, I haven't had to use the emergency stash of Narcan, but I mean, you just never know when you're going to run into a situation where, you know, um, it's, 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 yeah, you just really never know who's going to accidentally get a hold of something or um, you can't tell by just looking at a person whether they do drugs or not or whether they might be at risk. And so, um, but yeah, we, uh, we have it at the emergency department. Um, uh, that number for the IMAT team, if uh, somebody calls us, um, we can usually provide a box or two, especially, you know, if, say, if you find out your child is using and, you know, you want to be safe. Um, the, they're working on putting vending machines in some public buildings, courthouses, things like that. Uh, we're really trying to get it distributed around because it's such a life-saving drug that, um, you know, you just want to be able to get your hands on it quickly. Thank you. Yeah, sure. So, yeah, another resource that we have um, is the fentanyl test strips. And I do see those being passed out at bars and uh, clubs. There's uh, sometimes you have to pay like 50 cents or something for your fentanyl test strips, but sometimes they just have a bucket. Um, and what those are is um, a way to test your drugs to, uh, to find out if they have fentanyl in them. Um, and it's interesting because I thought those will never work because you have to waste some of your drugs to, to test them So because you have to put it in a little bit into some water and then you dip the, uh, the tester into the water like you would uh, a urinalysis test. Um, but I found that a lot of, a lot of folks really, you know, they, they don't want to die. They want to feel good. They really want to feel good, but they don't want to die. And so they use resources like that. And, uh, and sometimes we even, we, we, we pass them out um, in, in uh, homeless communities. And then we find that a lot of the folks, if we leave a business card, then those folks end up giving us a call. Um, and so it's a way to say, you know, we care. Like we don't necessarily condone what's going on, but we, but we want you to be safe and we, and we care and you can trust us, you know. Thank you. I have a question for you. 
Um, some people might assume all first responders, because you've got fire, you've got police, you've got ambulances. Do they all now carry and are trained in the use of narca? They do. There you go. They do. <laughs> yeah. So and that if, if someone senses that a, a person they know or a person they come across is having an emergency, those are good resources. Sure. If they're handy to contact. Absolutely. Absolutely. And it's really easy to use. A lot of people are worried about the Narcan. Oh my God, if I give them a dose of this, is it going to hurt them? It doesn't hurt the person. Mm -hmm. um, it's a simple nasal spray and just one squirt in the nostril. If they don't respond, give them one in the other nostril. Boom. You know, hopefully so they also, wake up. If, if someone is a self-professed drug user, can they obtain Narcan because they're concerned about they're going to continue buying and using drugs and they don't want to be dependent on someone helping them if they're in an emergency. Absolutely. Absolutely. And we would love for them to call us. Um, they can go to their nearest emergency room. Um, there's, there's plenty of ways uh, for them to get a hold. And we have a, you know, we have a handy box here and it's uh, it's just a, a little uh, nasal spray inside. And um, it looks just like uh, you would use your, uh, for a, for a cold. So what is the best place if someone wanted to obtain that? As I said, maybe they're a drug user. What is the best place for them to go to ask for it so they don't feel stigmatized? Is it a hospital? Is it, what are the places that this would be distributed? And they'll probably want to know, do I have to pay for it? Do I have to sign something? What's involved? Right. Do you... You can go to your healthcare provider and get it. You can go to a pharmacy and get it. Um, they're going to want to check if your insurance covers it or not because it's quite pricey. Mm -hmm. The health department has a supply of them, and we we will hand them out. In fact, I brought three of these. There's two um, sprays in each box, and we have 25 of these. Most people, when they take them, they'll take three or four, and I have instructions. I'll only give them to you if you'll take the instructions because it's simple, but yet, you got to do it right. So, but I do have, I do have them. Thank you. I have, I have some questions. So um, first of all, I just want to just thank you for coming to Brisbane and giving us the, the presentation. It was very comprehensive. You went through a lot of stuff, but it was really important that you, you know, covered all those different layers. You know, when, um, you know, you think of the opioid epidemic, it's been going on for a long time right? It was before COVID, right? And then COVID took the spotlight. And now this, you know, this epidemic that is continuing is now back in, in, in the forefront. Um, but, it, you know, it was like, oh, this is a, like an East Coast thing or a Midwest, a rural, you know, it, but we've had people in our own town die, mm -hmm. right? And, you know, you, and we, we've talked a lot about the stigma, right? And trying to, to, you can reduce that. And, you know, you'd be surprised how many people watch our council meetings that, you know, on their own time, right? Not, not live, but they'll go back and they'll watch. And, and what you've provided could really help people, right? You provided the information, um, how they can get um, the, you know, the Narcan. Um, you don't need any training, right? It's pretty simple directions. You just you just spray it in there if 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 you feel like you have it or, or an overdose or you think someone else is and the you know and if they don't have if they're not having a fentanyl overdose that's okay right there's no harm in that um you know part of the 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 reason for you being here today is is because someone you know came um to us as a council and said, Hey, you know, we got to do better, right? We, 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 we need to get the communication out there to our residents and, um, and let people really know that this is a problem and it isn't just, you know, somewhere else it's happening here. And so for you being here is great, you know, being able to get Narcan or Naloxone, right? Mm -hmm. Naloxone. Yeah. Naloxone. Naloxone, sorry. Um, 
you know, into more people's hands is going to save lives. Yes. Right. And so um, when you and I spoke, you know, um, earlier, um, you talked about like perhaps going to different, uh, you know, community events, right. And, and setting up a table and, 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 you know, so we have a farmer's market. Uh, we have a community day in the park. Um, you know, would you be willing to, to come to an event or like if say maybe you partner with our school districts, I know that our school district is, is getting um, the, the Narcan in all the schools and, and trying to educate parents and, and the students. Um, is that something that you think that maybe you might want to, to do in our community? Absolutely, yeah. Um, we have health department staff. We're limited in our in, in our staffing, but we have community partners. We have organizations in the community that serve different regions of San Mateo County who are looking for opportunities to be able to do education and to um, be at community events to talk about um, alcohol and other drug issues. All right, all right. Well, um, again, th thank you. Thank you so much. Appreciate it. Thank you. Thank you. We'll now move on to oral communications number one. Is there a member of the public? Okay. Wishing to speak on an item not on the agenda? Come on, Paul. We'll do two minutes. Not three minutes. I thought we went to three minutes. We went to three minutes. I'll give you three minutes. But Thanks. Please keep it to three. Paul Buscal, Brisbane resident. So I'm here again. Uh, before any of us started hearing the term atmospheric rivers, um, I was concerned about dead and diseased and dangerous trees. And I've written letters to the school district, which they've responded by having numerous trees removed from the school district property. But I'm very concerned <laughs> in our community, in the public right-of-ways, and at our parks, and at the schools. And it's been said that it's an act of God when trees come down. That's not true. If trees haven't been properly maintained, there's liability. If trees are dead and diseased, there's liability. So I believe it was the last council meeting I made the statement that I put the city attorney on notice as to liability. So if you think the cost of removing dead and diseased and trees that haven't been properly maintained and recognized by a certified arborist as being those type of trees, the cost of removing the trees is nothing compared to the cost of the liability to the city if somebody lost their life. So I would request from the council that you direct the city to have our, all of our trees, including at the school districts, um, reviewed by a, a certified arborist. And if they're deemed to be dead or diseased or dangerous trees because of the lack of maintenance, that's the big thing. You know, you look at what happened on El Camino Real. So it's been said before that just because I say the sky is falling doesn't mean the sky is falling. And I don't wanna rehash the catastrophic loss to life of a mother and daughter in this community because of something that could have taken just a phone call to uh, resolve the issue. I'm again having to say that this entire community is at risk and liability of a lawsuit. So we need to look at our trees and the eucalyptus trees, especially. I mean, you look around town and, and have seen what's happened. Please wrap up. Pardon me? Please wrap up. Okay, I'm done. Thank you. <laughs> Thank you. Is there anyone else? wishing to speak at this time? Okay. My name is Jesse Caracas. Um, thank you for your presentation tonight. Um, 
the one thing I kept thinking about during the um, presentation was, it seems um, not feasible for people to go down to the hospital, to a clinic and get one box. I think there's probably about a thousand households in Brisbane, something like that. Um, I would very much like to see a different sort of distribution because people, there is a stigma attached to it, you know? Like if I have this, I mean, grandma could overdose on Vicodin, you know? Mm -hmm. Almost happened to my mom. Uh, you know, children who uh, just find pills around. Um, anyway, I'd like to see some sort of better distribution from the county to the cities so, th so that the city could really get into everybody's medicine cabinet like it was Band-Aids. Thank you. Thank you. Is there anyone else wishing to speak? Come on. We have Seelock Samana, um, Humboldt Road. I too want to thank you for coming. Um, I too want to see the city push this, uh, the county to get uh, a very good supply of Narcan and get it into places here in our town, be it the library um, and also, I mean, places of business that have people come in. I think it is at epidemic proportions. I think it's three out of five under 25 is death related through I think technology. it's one out of five pardon me one out of five one out of five oh, there's a sign on the freeway I think, think it might even be a little bit more than one but I think the whole point is it has to be more readily available and I I really 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 appreciate um the attention to this problem for the city for for all of our cities and thank you very much is there anyone else wishing to speak at oral communications okay we'll now move on to the consent calendar we have had a request from the public to pull items F and G. So we'll entertain a motion for C, D, E, H, and I. So moved. Second. Roll call vote, please. Council Member Cunningham is absent. Council Member Lentz. Aye. Council Member Mackin. Aye. Council Member O'Connell. Aye. And Mayor Davis. Aye. Um, I was hoping that member of the public would join us this evening, but I don't think that they are online and they're not here in person. So um, I think there's maybe some, there would be some benefit to have a little bit of background from staff about what exactly these items are for. Um, so John, if you wouldn't mind. Sure, madam. Excuse me. Madam Mayor, did you say item E? The minutes of the closed session. Yeah. No, it's F, F and G. F and G. No, I said I'll I said F and G, but I said I'll make a motion for C D E H and I. Okay. Okay. I just miss misheard, so I wanted to make sure. Okay. Okay, thank you. Um, thank you, Madam Mayor. Both of these items uh, by the state law, state law planning law requires that the city submit an annual report, basically outlining our implementation of the housing element. So we have a housing element that was approved in 2015 that runs through 2023. So every year the city has to report on how many units were built, um, have we implemented the housing element policies, et cetera. So that's the uh, item um, G is that housing element annual report. Same report you've seen every year uh, in the past as well. And then the um, item H, I mean, item F rather, is the overall general plan. And so again, it's the same sort of uh, requirement. We send that to the state. We indicate what our policies are. Are we implementing those policies? We highlight any recent uh, updates uh, that we've implemented. And that's what the report is basically showing. Uh, we're not proposing, these aren't a vehicle to offer new policies or new language. All we're doing is reporting sort of retrospectively what we've done either in the last year or in the, some of these, especially in the general plan are ongoing. So we just kind of note that they're going forward on a regular basis. Um, but I know that some of the concerns in the correspondence related to policies we should have or, or other issues. And, you know, certainly that's the council's purview, but it really is not 
part of this particular item to, uh, we can't, the policies are what they are currently in the general plan. And if the city wants to change those, that's a whole separate process. We're just reporting on what the general plan says now and how we're implementing those programs or policies. I'd entertain any other questions you might have. So to reaffirm um, suggestions on how we might enhance our general plan or housing element, those those suggestions, what we're doing now is not implementing any changes. It's just giving a status report, it's just correct. giving an update. That's correct. Um, I discussed this with Clay and he said, this is more of a looking backwards, not looking forwards. What have we already done? Mm -hmm. Not what we're planning for in the future. So any comments regarding how we might improve, this is not the the time to um, make adjustments to either the general plan or the housing element. So with that clarification, um, I'll also see if there's anyone from the audience wishing to speak on either of these items. Okay, Paul. Thank you, Paul Buscal, Brisbane resident. So I just wasn't sure because it, there wasn't any information regarding the senior housing uh, issue for the housing element. And I would hope that that could be included as to the need for senior housing in Brisbane and the site at the 23 Club parking lot in particular. Again, I believe we'll, should be, huh? Oh, I was just going to respond to you. Sure. So what we're doing here is we're just giving this data progress report. We're not amending anything. So any comments about um, how we might you know, better identify sites would be when we would be at a different time. It wouldn't be it. It's that's not what we're looking I, at right now. I understood, but oh, okay. I thought it was that we were setting areas aside for housing and I didn't see any senior housing included in that, what we were submitting to the state. That's all. Okay. Thank you. Thank you. So with that, I'll entertain a motion to I'll make a motion to approve item F and G. Second. Roll call vote, please. Council member Cunningham is absent. Council member Lentz. Aye. Council member Mackin. Aye. Council member O'Connell. Aye. Mayor Davis. Aye. We'll now move on to staff reports, city managers report on upcoming activities. Thank you, Madam Mayor. I've um, got a couple of items of uh, interest to um, provide an update to the council and to those who may be uh, watching this meeting. Um, our uh, committees have um, a couple of interesting items that uh, the public may have an interest in. Um, Monday, March 20th, uh, the Public Art Advisory uh, Committee will review requests for proposal samples from other cities and begin framing key components of a public arts master plan RFP for Brisbane. Um, when they have a recommendation that will come to the city council. Um, the open space and ecologies committee meeting uh, next Wednesday, one of the items they will be discussing, discussing is recommending to the council a resolution of support for a state bill that would require cow purrs and cow stirs to divest from fossil fuels. Uh, this may sound familiar uh, as it was a repeat of a resolution that they recommended and the council approved last year, um, but was held up in uh, state legislative committee. Um, a reminder that on April 6th, the city council meeting, uh, staff will be presenting the complete streets safety committee recommendation and guidelines for a proposed residential permit parking program for central Brisbane. Um, and then finally, just a reminder to everyone that the draft Bayland specific plan prepared by the property owner, Baylands Development Inc., has been made available to city's website, brisbaneca.org slash Baylands. Uh, the draft specific plan is also a hard copy format at City Hall and the Brisbane Library. Um, we want to continue to emphasize that this plan is the applicant's proposal and the community will have an opportunity to weigh in on the plan and related environmental impact report for, through uh, public review process. Um, as mentioned in last week's blast and where the residents may have received a postcard in the mail, the Baylands development team, again, the private developer, is hosting a meeting at the community center this Saturday at 1 p.m. and another one virtually next Tuesday at 6.30 p.m. If you would like information on that, you can go to brisbaneca.org slash blast. 
that's it, that's for this Thank evening. you. So now we're at mayor council matters. Um, so we're going to be adjusting how we report out on this, um, on this topic. So uh, council members have requested to receive um, the document that outlines all of the subcommittees that we've had in the packet. So that only includes the subcommittees that occurred in the week prior. So what we'll be doing is in order to do that, we will report out on the subcommittees you had not this week, but last week. And then at our next meeting, we'll report out the meetings you had the week prior. So if you look at the back of your packet, it has um, from March 3rd to March 10th, there were no council subcommittees unless you had a, um, a, a county subcommittee, feel free. And then you can see what the upcoming subcommittees are. Um, and then if you had any this week as well, you would report that out at the next meeting. Um, so does anyone have any um, county meetings that they attended last week that they would like to report out on? No? It was blissfully quiet. <laughs> okay, none from you, okay. So we will move on to written communications. Um, I did have written communications from Dana Dilworth. Would you like to read out the comprehensive list? Um, we just have two correspondences from Dana Dilworth. Um, one about the general plan update and also um, uh, for the housing element progress report. And now we are at oral communications number two. Is there anyone from the public wishing to speak? Okay, Paul. So Paul Buscal, Brisbane resident. Um, I'd like to know if it's three minutes or two minutes for oral communications. It's, it's as I determined. Oh, it's okay. Yes. So uh, because I couldn't wrap it up, I wanted to also say about the issue with the trees. Um, most of us in the community are in our homes during these events, with the exception of public works, police and fire, and other utility companies that come into this community to help us. So they're all at risk from being killed or injured and our equipment and other things being uh, impacted by falling trees. So um, coming to these meetings and raising a concern and never being told that, hey, we're gonna, we're gonna have a, a meeting and we're gonna talk about that. And we're gonna make sure that our trees, all our trees are inspected and not just on the public right of ways, but private property trees, as you could see what happened around the corner right around the corner of that huge eucalyptus tree that fell down. So when do we have any response from not only the council, but um, the city engineer and arborist and others involved? You know, it's, it's not enough to come up here and, and raise a concern and uh, just uh, say, okay, thank you for your input. When, when do you take action? Can you answer that? No, it's not agendized. Okay, can you agendize it? Can you put it on an agenda? I'm not gonna. I'm not gonna commit to that right now. We're well, having that's a typical. Right now. Can, okay. can we can we change the norm and and have a response? No, it's not agendized. Okay, so you and the rest of the council, unfortunately, are liable <laughs> if something does happen for not taking action. Inaction is, is bad. Do you understand that? Or maybe the city attorney could chime in. Paul, why don't you give us a little time to bring... I've, I've brought this up for years. I brought it up months ago. I brought it up at the last meeting. Why don't you give us time to think about how we can address this? Because tonight we can't respond to that, but we can work on it. I am requesting that it's put on an agenda and all the people that are yay sayers are at that meeting. I mean, you realize you're liable, right? 
if something happens and, and you took no action. Okay, Paul, your time is up. Yeah, obviously my time's up. It's always up. That's all you want to do is get past it. So I don't appreciate it and it doesn't serve this community. Madam Mayor, and maybe I'll just be real quick and just help a little bit here. I, in, I want to assure anybody that's listening, we are paying attention to the trees that are in the public right away. We had inspections and in arborists and city staff uh, reviewing a number of trees in the last few weeks um, around town. Um, so it's we're not blind to um, potential safety issues, and we are trying to take them very serious. Thank you. I did speak to Public Works and um, they had already told me about several trees that they had already identified were at risk of falling and were already making arrangements to have those addressed. So, and removing uh, cars and public access to those areas to prevent any injuries um, should that tree come down before it's able to be um, taken down by a professional. Okay, so City Clerk, is there anyone else virtually wishing to make a comment? There are none, Madam Mayor. Okay, so I will adjourn the meeting at 827.